We took four of the greatest provinces around and mixed them together in a pot. The feds were tarred and feathered. We kicked them out of town. And this is what we got. Welcome to British Saskatchewan and Toba. We're mighty when we're drunk, mighty grumpy when we're sober. From the sea to the mountains to the aurora borealis. British Saskatchewan and Toba. Uber Alice. Coming to you from the West Coast, this is Politicos. Today is February 8th, 2018, and this is episode 72. Politicos is not edge of the seat exciting but we're exceptionally well-informed, at least according to John Moxon at JWMox on Twitter. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe and leave a review wherever you found us. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter where we're at Politicos Pod and support the show at patreon.com slash politicos. I'm Scott Galinabone. And I'm Ian Bushfield. We're looking for more local music to feature over the next few weeks, so if you know of any local artists or are one, tell them about us. On today's show, we have a ton of BC Poly content for you. One of those... We could do three episodes today, but we'll squeeze it all into an hour-ish. The BC Liberal leadership race came to a conclusion last weekend. Alberta launched a wine versus pipeline trade war. And we preview the by-election coming up in Kelowna West. But first, as always, we have to thank our premier sponsors, Lindsay Teds and Blake Hodson, for helping make the show possible. And before we get into today's show, there's been some... Canadian politics podcast drama. Uh, Canada Land launched a new politics podcast, Oppo, with Jen Gerson and Justin Ling. And oddly enough, Jesse Brown of Canada Land, in kind of yet another bad take, pitched as filling a niche, which is ironically quite full. And you can check out our long list of Canadian politics podcasts on our website. Yeah, he mentioned how there's no Chapo Trap House or Slate Stock Kyle or Crooked Media level Canadian politics podcast. And there are multiple dirtbag leftist podcasts that I listen to that are in that list. And there's us and there's other shows. So it was at least a good chance for all the other Canadian politics podcasts to get our name out there on Twitter, even though Oppo was on the top of the Canadian podcast charts because Canada Land has that much sway. No apology for him yet. He did actually retweet one of those podcasts with the links to more, so hopefully that helps. The other thing that happened this week was the think tank McDonald Laurier Institute launched their own podcast, which they called Pod Keep Our Land Glorious and Free. And Longtime listeners will know one of our good friends of the show is the podcast Pod Keep Our Land, not glorious and free, I guess, with Patrick, Matthew, and Aaron. And we had Aaron on a couple weeks ago. And you'd think the people at McDonald Laurier Institute could do a quick Google search to figure out if any other podcasts exist with the same name. So it's not like research is their thing. Patrick did end up emailing them to say, hey, about that. And they said, sorry. And they've now changed their podcast to Pod bless Canada, which that's great. <laughs> I did listen to it. If you're into neoliberalism, it's still probably pretty dry. If you really want to find out about the debt wall in the 90s. But in all seriousness, I'm glad to see more Canadian politics podcasts. And we do maintain a list on our website. So the link for that will be in the show notes as always. Getting into segment one, another Andrew at the helm. So did you know that a Rhodes Scholar is now leader of the opposition? I, I'm only saying that because literally every single article has mentioned that. So I'm assuming this is critical information all British Columbians need to know. Are you talking about Dr. Lawyer Andrew Wilkinson? Yes. He's the next Gordon Campbell, if you haven't heard as well. That's the other thing I've heard bring up is the man is smart. And it's interesting because I saw someone share in a totally unrelated forum, a Scientific American article about do smart leaders do worse? And it's actually pointing that maybe if you get above an IQ of 120 in business leadership, you actually perform worse, perhaps because people can't relate to you or things like that. But in any case, smart man Andrew Wilkinson is now leader of the BC Liberal Party after a five of five possible round ballot that you got to watch in person. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was at the uh, leadership convention uh, here in Vancouver last weekend. And 
there was excitement in the air until, well, it took about an hour to go from results of round one to round two, and then the energy pretty much died for a good chunk of the evening. But it got a little more excited near the end as Andrew Wilkinson slowly crept up through the night and finally overtook uh, Michael Lee, who'd been hanging around second place. Uh, and he did that in the uh, fourth round. So for those who haven't followed the worst jokes on Twitter, the liberals do not use first past the post. And we did get a ton of those nominations the last two weeks. And we're not doing any of them. The yeah, joke it... is dead. But the BC liberals have this system of voting, which is like the federal conservatives, where each constituency is worth 100 points based on how many votes happen in there. So if there are 90 liberals, as there were in a couple ridings, they did the same as 9,000 votes in another riding. So some people had 13 times the vote strength as others because some of those Fraser Valley ridings were very dense with BC Liberals and some of those downtown Vancouver ridings were not. Yeah, even uh, PEI isn't skewed that much in terms of uh, power votes. But the system does make sense for the broader electoral system we have, I think, at least that we have for now. It means that whoever wins can show a wide swath of support across the province. And that seems to have been the strategy that Wilkinson got through on. Yeah, interestingly, Wilkinson's top ridings, nine of them were outside of Metro Vancouver, and his 10th one was his own riding in Vancouver. So which, yeah, suggests that despite being kind of written off as, you know, the urban Vancouverite candidate who, you know, doesn't have much appeal, he's looks like he can play well in the rest of the province. So we haven't actually gone through the results, and we don't need to go point by point and round by round, but I think it's worth mentioning, you mentioned Andrew Wilkinson jumping over Michael Lee, but that first round was the most interesting because you had Diane Watts with a healthy lead-ish over Michael Lee of a couple hundred points, and then you had... Andrew Wilkinson, Todd Stone, and Mike DeYoung all separated by about 100 of 1,600 points. So they were all within about a percentage point or two in the chance of winning. And Sam Sullivan was down there with 2% of the points. But Yeah, it was a poly 158. He admitted on his interview with Vancouver's Awesomes podcast that he was on this week that he wasn't really in it to win. And he recorded that interview before the <laughs> race results were announced. Yeah, if if he was in it to win it, he probably wouldn't have come out against the minimum wage. He wasn't against <laughs> it. He just wanted not as many people to be paid it. Wilkinson did manage to edge out Todd Stone and Mike DeYoung. And I egged Stephen Carter, who was the strategist for Mike DeYoung's campaign for that. But realistically, they were close enough that winning a few more votes here or there could have changed this entire first round entirely, in which case... I think any of those three people could have still been leader because the prediction that it was a anyone but Diane Watts vote in the end was the best one. Because Diane Watts picked up a few points through the second choice and third choice ballots, but it was really just Andrew Wilkinson who was able to climb up with, I guess, the establishment. The We like the BC Liberals as they are. It was just Christy Clark was the wrong person to do it. And we just forgot how to be Gordon Campbell. And so they found the most Gordon Campbell guy they could. Wilkinson has also been compared to Monty Burns, I've seen, and the Bond villain, Blofeld. So for the data analysis, the BC Liberals were helpful enough to actually release the raw votes in each of the constituencies, which Quantlin data scientist Chad Skelton, who we have to get on the podcast at some point, crunched very thoroughly and in every possible way and transcribed into a Google spreadsheet, which we'll put on the show notes, all the different variations and charts that you could imagine. So he shows that Michael Lee actually had the most raw votes. So in a first past the post system, he would have been the leader. But that makes sense when Lee had bragged that he signed up the most people. And what was also interesting there is Andrew Wilkinson had the second fewest first round votes. He was just he was well ahead of Sam Sullivan, and he was just a dozen votes or so behind Mike DeYoung. But that shows he just had the most efficient votes, I guess. He had them exactly where he needed them. Yeah, his uh, strategy 
worked out well and was not necessarily apparent. I think it's his victory took a fair number of people by surprise. I know a couple of people who worked on his campaign and they were all, you know, oh yeah, no, we're, we're good. We're good. Even, even during the early rounds of counting where he wasn't uh, looking so hot. But yeah, I, I think they had just a well-executed campaign on there that was able to capture those second and third choice votes that were really critical. Well, Wilkinson was the one who went out actively with Mike DeYoung and said, we are going to put each other's people as second and all of our voters should vote the other guy. And that would have worked for Mike DeYoung if he had placed a bit ahead. But again, didn't quite make that in the end. So Wilkinson had his strength, like you mentioned, outside Vancouver. He had tons of support in the Kootenays, Okanagan, and even around the Coquitlam Maple Ridge area. Really diverse set of ridings. Diane Watts, unsurprisingly, had a lot of support in Surrey and Metro <laughs> Vancouver. Don't say. I think it was her like 17th most successful riding was the first one to be outside Vancouver. Michael Lee, similarly, was concentrated in Richmond, Surrey, Burnaby, and Vancouver suburbs. Todd Stone was super popular in Kamloops, where he's an MLA, and a lot of other interior ridings. Otherwise, there were 30,000 votes cast, and interestingly, Skelton found that by the last round, 7,000 people just didn't fill out their ballots, so there were quite a few people voting who went, I don't like enough of these people to finish ranking. Yeah, because it was a rain bell. You only have to rank as many people as you feel like. So yeah, plenty of people didn't end up uh, putting them all down. Like I know people who put everyone but Diane Watts on their ballot. Which, when you have six people, putting a six person doesn't matter. It really um, doesn't. But but, it, but there's a principle there's, to there's it. There's a little extra in there that mathematically isn't really there, but nevertheless feels good. So... Who is Andrew Wilkinson and what does he campaign on? I was clever enough to check out his platform, at least while it was still being announced that he was winner, and it was still on his website, and I saved it to my phone, and now it's on our Google Drive, so we can share that later if you want to review what he ran on. The first thing he mentioned after winning and the first thing in his platform is that he needs to kill proportional representation referendum because it will destroy democracy in B.C., or at least it will tear apart the Liberal Party, but you can't say that because that sounds crass. He also wants to abolish the small business income tax on family businesses. I don't know if he considers small businesses and small family businesses separate categories. It was unclear. Yeah, it's not very clear on that. It's not also not a great policy. Like it's, We should just have one business tax rate. We shouldn't be trying to to have different levels of it because we want our small businesses to become large businesses and well if you jack up their tax rate when they do there's yeah some disincentives there you say that now but when we incorporate politicoast <laughs> it might change i don't think this is going to be a family business so we might not uh, get that tax rate uh, well the small business tax rate's only two percent right now so going from two percent to zero does cost you some money which he is going to pay for through the carbon tax because that'll be revenue neutral again. He, I think you'll like, is really big on really redoing the planning situations for uh, urban development and making sure we can get zoning through. Yeah, quite like that. He wants timely, reliable, and transparent land use planning in BC, which is good because none of those adjectives currently describe our land use policies. Pretty much everything on his housing platform comes down on the supply side as if you want to frame the debate as simply as that but he has more things in there about making sure we can build more around uh transit lines yeah, and, and there's there's some good stuff in there like and you know i'd love to see a bc version of california's um sb 827 which is a currently before the state senate there then that's if it passes would basically gut the ability of local governments to say yeah no that that you know billion dollar transit infrastructure we're not actually going to put anything near it or allow any you know people to live near it he's big on lng as well throughout here and one of the few times he mentions first nations or indigenous people is he wants to continue and build partnerships with the many first nation champions of lng but he doesn't really mention the first nations groups that oppose them i guess he 
they'll just pick sides, which is fine as long as you're upfront about it. I mean, he's going to be called a dick for it, but that doesn't seem to concern him with his, the approach he's taken. He is big on privatizing our liquor distribution system by first selling government-owned liquor stores with employees getting the first right to purchase them, I guess, in a cooperative setting. And he also wants private liquor stores to be able to sell to restaurants. And he literally says, as a first step, to full privatization. So I imagine he's imagined pulling apart BC liquor control and letting it go. Yeah, which, you know, it's not the wor worst idea. And like, some of our literature stuff's a little nuts. And there's no reason why the government needs to be in the business of retail. Like, retail is one of those things the market actually does quite well. And we don't really need the government to step in. And you avoid the really dumb situation like what happened, what, two weeks ago now with the raids on the whiskey places because they had to, they couldn't import it through the government own distribution branch because the orders were too small but jumping ahead then we couldn't ban all alberta craft beer from coming into bc if we yeah, wanted to start still a not different trade the downside here he has some policies that are a little less developed like reducing overdose deaths by 50 percent in the first two years which that'd be great tell me how <laughs> he literally just says that well if we outlaw overdose deaths but only half of them like, if you're going to throw numbers out there, why not get rid of all overdose deaths? Why not shoot for the stars? The one thing I did like, even though I'll make fun, is he did have a whole section in there on hashtag me too, and he talked a lot about sort of gender equality things. He did point out that he would want to keep a balance, gender balanced cabinet, keep boards of crown corporations and health authorities balanced. His campaign was headed by a woman, Katie Merrifield, who will hopefully get on the show to find out what she did right to win this. He also wants to extend some of the sexual violence and misconduct policies across the public sector and have this Women's Advisory Council to try and tackle harassment within the public sector. So so I think that's all a good step, especially capturing the zeitgeist of the moment and some of the stuff we've been talking about. And he had this, I think, in there before the scandal started hitting the other PC parties. So oh, it's not a PC party. It's the liberals. That's fair. That's true. That all said, I found the approach he took to Diane Watts in one of the debates a bit more, like, needlessly vicious. And maybe that's just him personally. And I don't think it was a, like... He can be a scrapper. Yeah. And the thing he said about the NDP after he won was he wants to put questions to them that make their skin crawl, which <laughs> is just a weird turn of phrase. So he's a mixed bag of flies, I guess to use a weird turn of <laughs> phrase that a physics professor used to use in my one of my classes. That said, his policy document is pretty blank on anything like the foreign buyers tax, which was a BC liberal policy. Yeah, I mean, it hasn't done a huge amount in the, what, year and a half since we've got it? Yeah, he could say whether he wants to keep it or get rid of it. He, like I said, doesn't have a ton else on Indigenous issues. He does mention their the need to improve education rates and foster care systems. But he doesn't really approach reconciliation as a whole or UNDRIP or some of these larger issues. But that's his choice again. His education section I also found pretty thin. He recognizes that the court has told him he needs to, the BC government needs to put more money in, but his other policies are kind of boutique. There's junior kindergarten tax deduction for tutoring and computer literacy emphasis which is fine but we have a district north okanagan shoe swap that's hiring unqualified teachers because they can't find qualified fully certified teachers right now and this is a scandal for teachers in the bctf because we want people with proper certifications to be teaching in our schools so yeah like, it, it, cats to die, like, they're just not great ways to you know get stuff done it will help middle class and upper class parents who are the only people who actually hire tutors. Yeah, but probably don't that's if them. they you know claim it and what however that work goes to just be you know yet another thing clogging up the tax code that you know five people use because nobody ever checks the box because everyone forgets about it. There's not much else on there on other taxes though. He doesn't say what the income tax rate should do. He doesn't go into Sam Sullivan's dangerous territory of a harmonized sales tax again 
No, it's a modified sales tax because we can't talk about the HST. Well, that was the other thing he said on this Vancouver is Awesome podcast. He's like, it's the HST again. <laughs> so it was pretty clear that it was the HST, yeah. but just not called the HST. And then, I, interestingly, Wilkinson's also pretty silent in that document on ICBC, which we'll mention briefly later, but is a dumpster fire according to everyone right now or BC Hydro, though he does say he's in favor of Site C, or BC Ferries. So I guess it's less about those affordability issues that the NDP ran on, and more on the, we'll be the free enterprise party. Drink. Once again. How do you think this will play against... How do you think this makes the BC Liberals play against the other parties, though? I think there's a decent chance he'll be able to reclaim some of the soft green support that kind of fled the party in the last election. You know, the people who are, yeah fiscally conservative, care about the environment, those sorts of people who are kind of fed up with the liberals after the decade plus in power and, you know, ended up voting green. They're they're likely to come back to the party. I, I can't see them being put off by Wilkinson. In terms of the NDP, it's harder to say. I mean, Horton's doing a not terrible job right now. It hasn't really angered very many people yet, or especially people who are accessible liberal voters so i eh, have to see in a couple of years yeah he's definitely the biggest threat i think to the bc greens right now you now have two andrews both with the last name w and who are doctors who are both doctors or professors at least get the title doctor who are both highly educated white men actually bc i heard this in a different place i forget where but bc is now the only province without or with only white men as main party leaders. Wasn't there a bunch of the Maritimes like that? No one counts the Maritimes. So the BC Liberals and BC Greens both have these similar style leaders and these similar passionate people. And and if Andrew Wilkinson starts to build up some environmental policy, and it doesn't need to be a skyrocket the carbon tax and do this this stuff, I think other people have called it, you know, put out the platform of put solar panels on roofs and tax incentives for windmills or things like that and mix it with a sort of Gordon Campbell approach, he could eat up a lot of that green support. The BC NDP can always just grab 40% of the vote. And the other factor in play out there, well, it's not really in play, but we like to talk about them, is the BC Conservatives are pitching this as Trudeau supporter Andrew Wilkinson (laughs) in everything they can put out and are now saying, Small small C conservatives, you should come on home to the BC conservatives. Yeah, well, they, they've been trying to split the free enterprise drink coalition for a while now, and I can't see anyone really biting on that. They'll get 1% of the vote, and basically no one will pay attention to them because well, everyone who's currently in the BC liberal tent realizes they're not going to keep winning if... They aren't in that tent. It sounds like Wilkinson has enough personality and likability within the party to hold that coalition together, where it was seeming like if Todd Stone had won after all of the allegations had come out about fake membership numbers or Diane Watts, who just half the party hates, had won, that the party might have fallen into civil war, whereas Wilkinson might have actually been the only choice to really keep it together effectively like mike de young could probably have been a close second but he's even got his polarizing attitudes yeah and he's i don't think he can grow the party to the extent that wilkinson can't like i think a de young led liberal party has a much lower ceiling the one problem for growing the party for wilkinson though is the man lacks charisma he, yeah, but in the defense of those who lack charisma, we had a prime minister for 10 years with effectively no charisma. So it's it's not a win or lose proposition in it politics. It did take him three elections to get that majority. So have to see how this goes. If proportional representation comes through in the referendum in the fall, it could throw that wrench into the BC Liberal coalition. And, you know, you could have the BC Conservatives carve off a whole bunch of votes. In terms of the party unity, I was hearing rumors that if so-and-so had won or so-and-so had won, that there were MLAs who would think of seriously crossing the floor or 
sitting as independents rather than be with them. And I don't think that's true under Wilkinson, at least. So he doesn't have to worry about that yet. Ultimately, I think this is a fairly good choice on the Liberals part and will probably position them fairly well to be able to recapture those few seats they need to actually edge over majority territory. If they're lucky. Moving on to our second segment, Drunk Kurt. The name for this segment comes from Strategist Podcast, who actually revived their Twitter account just to heckle the entire Twitter sphere of hashtag AB Ledge, which is the Alberta Poly hashtag, and hashtag BC Poly for using dumb tags this week like hashtag BC Wine, when they clearly needed to be using Drunk Kirk as the proper way to refer to the ongoing trade war that has now started between BC and Alberta because Alberta had won their one against Saskatchewan. Can we just take a moment to to just reflect on how crazy it is a trade war is even something a province can have with another province? Can we just talk about how peak our content this is when you mix both dumb liquor laws with dumb trade wars? It's just perfect content. I'm happy with it. So for the background, on Friday, BC Environment Minister George Heyman announced this intention to bring in some new regulations that would require a review around the science of how diluted bitumen interacts with water, say if a pipeline spilled into English Bay here. He also said, until that's done, there's going to be a moratorium on new shipments of diluted bitumen through BC, whether by rail or expanded pipeline capacity, most notably, meaning that we need to do some science, and then we will talk about expanding Kinder Morgan. Everyone saw through this pretty easily because the BC NDP has talked about doing everything they legally can to slow down or stop Kinder Morgan. And this seems like a pretty stark strategy for doing it. This, this was the thinnest of facades. Rachel Notley called them on it immediately and said, this is unconstitutional, you can't do this, rah, rah, rah. Trudeau went, I'm not going to talk about it because I don't want to. Although, uh, although he has said he does support the pipeline. Sure, yeah, he supports the pipeline, but he also doesn't want to get heckled again, which we can get to later. May have missed this, but I don't think he's taken a position on BC wines yet. No, yeah, we have to dig into that. This bickering back and forth over the weekend led to hashtag March on Fernie trending, which was some random Alberta people saying, if BC is not going to build our pipeline, we're going to invade and make Alberta rectangle like Saskatchewan by taking the East Kootenays off and getting all the way to Fernie, which I realized would mean the BC Liberals would lose somewhere between 8 and 13 seats, depending on how they carved off, and the NDP would lose two, which would in the end, give the NDP a majority government. So maybe Horgan didn't oppose it for that reason. (laughs) It's the Marton Fernie conspiracy theory. I I feel like losing a chunk of your province probably negatively hurts your re-election prospects. Yeah, especially the places with the good skiing. I mean, we'd still have Whistler, but we'd lose. We might be able to keep Sun Peaks depending on which side of Kamloops goes, but we'd lose all the Okanagan, all the Kicking Horse and Panorama and some of those things out there. So. And honestly, BC without the ski, like, what's the point of that? (laughs) You still got the coastline. So following this on Monday, I think it was, Rachel Notley announced that Alberta would no longer accept BC wine at all. And period, end of story, it's done. People went, wait, can she do that? And it turns out because our liquor laws date to the prohibition and the government just buys liquor from other provinces, she can. And she just basically told the Alberta Gaming Liquor Control Branch to not buy any more BC wine until this is done. And so what's on the shelves in their private liquor stores will soon be out and they won't get any more Alberta or BC wine. This was met with widespread satire and outrage and confusion with her being hailed as anywhere between a hero and a child, depending on how you view this approach. Technically, it's legal, as far as I can tell. There's no requirement under the Constitution that she has to buy. Well, but there's the argument that, you know, 
goods from one province should be allowed into the others. Well, that's the Como case, and you can go back and listen to Micah's analysis of that, which was fairly pessimistic. But if the Como on, case is one right at the Supreme there, Court of Canada... The constitu- oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, this is a major pet peeve. Horgan was ironically overseas in East Asia on a trade mission trying to promote LNG which a lot of environmentalists weren't impressed with, but they were impressed with Heyman's announcement. So they, it was a very tough weekend for the environmentalists and the Greens. But now they've all sided with their duty to drink BC wine, leading the environmentalists across the country to post pictures of themselves drinking wine. Apparently it's a big movement in Quebec now among the environmentalists there who hate pipelines. They're in solidarity with us. But when Horgan did get back and held a press conference, he said, meh, like... He's not going to really challenge this because it's a distraction. He's got bigger things to focus on. He says that's annoying, but I'm going to stand. He also said he'd stand up for BC wine, but he also wouldn't challenge it. So it was a bit of a both sides. Well, trade wars are just one of those things where everybody loses. And it's largely a case of, well, I'll hurt my people in the hopes that your people might also kind of get hurt a bit too, but it's it's a self-hostage situation is what most trade wars are. We won't be banning Alberta beef. We won't be banning the stampede, I guess, or wheat or barley or the other things that come out of Alberta. Cowboy hats. I grew up in Alberta. I can make these jokes. That the BC's Roar and Stetson import business isn't yeah, threatened? Yeah, Lamley's Western wear. Jason Kenney and the Conservative Party of Canada are livid, and Kenney thinks Notley should be suing over, like, the BC NDP's policy isn't in place yet, so there's nothing to actually sue, but they've already started creating legal arguments about the specific sections of the Constitution they need to file injunctions on. That's great. <laughs> I think this is one of those situations where all of the political incentives for John Horgan are to keep doing what he's doing, and all the political incentives for Rachel Notley are to keep doing what she's doing. But the broader, let's make Canada work incentives don't play into anyone's hand. Except maybe, maybe in Trudeau's. Maybe into Trudeau's, but he also probably just wants to stay out of the way because it's a mud fight that he doesn't want to get in the middle of. Yeah, it's a bit of a Toby Ashton Maru for... A Trudeau getting credit for a pipeline in alberta is probably never going to happen even though he is ki killing the national energy board which we'll get to but it's been a fun week yeah i've seen a bunch of people say some version of oh this is you know why can't they just talk it you know this is a misunderstanding sort of thing you know it's a failure to communicate no it, it, it isn't it, it's a case of the incentives are such that fighting this thing makes more sense for both sides. And they have communicated. They have been on the phone and talked to each other, and they're probably realistically pretty pleasant conversations where they're like, yeah, sorry about this, John. Yeah, sorry, Rachel. You know how we're still friends? Yeah, we're still friends. All right, I'm going to go scream at you some more. <laughs> and it goes on and on. So the incentives are what they are in Alberta, and pipelines are this sacred cow of politics there that if you aren't in favor of them... You're going to be run out of the province, essentially. Well, it's the no politician in any province is going to be against that province's largest industry. It's just not going to happen. You, you'll never see an Ontario premier say, we're going to shut down manufacturing. It's, it's just not going to happen. But there is this space, I think, within the Alberta left, or maybe it's just because I know too many people who live in Edmonton, which is a very probably It's NDP probably thing. that. But she could start to create and needed to realistically as soon as she got in start to create space for more than just oil because alberta needs to do that anyway alberta needs to diversify its economy and create more industry so it can get out of these stupid boom bust oil cycles because eventually either they're going to run out of oil or more realistically the rest of the world will have moved on and the argument for this pipeline is to get more oil to market before that happens but putting more oil on the market will also drive prices down because supply goes up which then hurts the ability to pull it out because oil right now is not expensive enough to pull it out of the tar sands or the oil sands whatever you want to call it 
So it's this situation that doesn't really make sense when you look at it at a bigger scale, I think. But then you're against jobs if you suggest maybe there's a way forward without building this new pipeline. Yeah, the, the thing about diversifying Alberta's economy is it's easier said than done. I What does Alberta diversify into? It's too far away from any major market and landlocked to do manufacturing. Why would you live in, you know, cold, snowy Alberta when there's nice coastal areas that don't get covered in snow if you're going to start a tech company? Like, there's just a... But the, the snow obvious... keeps your computers cold half the year, and then they're like 30 <laughs> degrees in the summer because of climate yeah, change. Yeah, so it probably but... comes out in the wash, and I think electricity is cheaper out here anyway. The point is, like, it's... Economies aren't the sort of thing you can just easily turn a few knobs on and redirect the major industry of an area and alberta isn't dealt a great hand for other industries beyond you know agriculture and oil they have a good amount of wind which if they wanted to really and they are putting some effort into wind generation we talked with uh dan vinilovich about the wind farms they're starting to put up at a pretty good rate and that it's the sort of Green Party dream of let's have everyone building wind farms like they do in Germany. So there's it's, there's options. And it's, it's, it's not it's that you need something. to actually be successful. It's politics, right? You just need yeah. to get the rhetoric and paint the picture and get people to buy into it. But that's a lot of work Well, versus banning BC wine is apparently the easiest thing. Well, you actually do have to get it to work if you want to shift where the jobs are far enough that not champion in oil all the time is actually a viable political strategy. You have to get it to work if you want to get reelected again. Which I believe Notley does. So how do we get out of this? What's the end of this standoff? Everyone grows the fuck up and starts, starts behaving like adults and ends this dumb trade war? No, that's not going to happen. <laughs> the, the federal government comes down and says... You know, no, this is a federation where actually you just have to let each other's products into the each other's provinces, like the fucking constitution says. No, we're also not going to see that happen. We're probably going to see this push to the edge of a court case. And you're mentioning the constitution. There is also the New West Free Trade Partnership. I forget the exact name of it, but it's the Western Canada, the four provinces trade agreement and there's the canada free trade agreement i think both of those actually exempt yeah liquor. definitely the canada one had uh exemptions but and... the spirit is there yeah i actually get the sense that uh the new west partnership was a lot more enthusiastic when it was three center right governments but they did get in manitoba's ndp onto it and they're not against it they were threatening to invoke these things against saskatchewan so i think it will come to more this isn't going to end this week we're going to see more people really do dumb pictures of themselves with wine oh yeah i'm going to a winery this weekend i'm definitely taking pictures of wine and being we would be drinking bc wine right now if i'd gone and picked some up but i only have one bottle in my fridge right now and i'm not getting the nice stuff from downstairs for podcasting but yeah i'm sure we'll see something drawn pretty close to court before anyone blinks i think horgan's in the better position to be able to just keep brushing it off. And unfortunately, that makes Rachel Notley look more childish. And to be fair, she did pull the child card of, I'm going to ban your wine. Probably still have a soft spot for her and the win she managed to pull off. It's kind of like watching my two friends fight. And I'm like, I don't like it. Come on, get along. That seems like good enough place to transition into segment three, wine countries voting ironically enough while bc wines are being banned in alberta Kelowna west goes to the polls on wednesday valentine's day and Kelowna west is probably the highest concentration of wineries in the province per her constituency and one of the candidates bc liberal ben stewart owns a winery quailsgate one of the biggest and is largely expected to win but how do you think this by-election shaping up especially win <laughs> I, I I could say a lot more about it. It's Kelowna West. It's going liberal. N no matter what happens, you know, it's more or less going liberal. Like, 
whoever won the leadership, it was done liberal, whatever's happening with this wine dis- dispute or tantrum, it's it's doing liberal. It's one of the safest liberal seats in the province. Yeah, Martin Brown had a piece in the Georgia Strait trying to get under the liberal skins because since he left the BC Liberals, that's all he does now. Trying to oh, paint everyone a- needs a hobby. Yeah, everyone needs a hobby. He tried to paint a path for how Shelley Cook, the NDP candidate, could win. And it was long and convoluted and all the cards had to fall right. But I think the attack on small business by an NDP government, even though it's a different NDP government, still plays into his hand. Shelley Cook seems like a great candidate for the NDP. As we've mentioned before, former executive director of the John Howard Society and has run for them in the past. We did get an email from... Clayton Wellwood, the leader of the Libertarians, mentioning their candidate, and Kyle. And past guest. And past guest, uh, Kyle Geronizo. His pitch is mostly around privatizing ICBC as the way to clean up the mess there. And the BC Conservatives candidate, Mark Thompson, is pitching the same kind of idea of turning ICBC into a cooperative, though, and then opening up insurance to a private market. It's a real conservative thing is go co-op. Yeah. Uh, The Libertarians, Kyle, his profile on Facebook, at least, says, and his Facebook page, I wasn't stalking him personally, says he's studied electronics, philosophy, and psychology. He's a furniture expert right now, and notes that he's always a tinkerer. He uses the word tinkerer. He really just thinks BC needs different options, so he's trying to give that out there. And the Conservatives have a former Saskatoon councillor, but he's moved to BC a few years ago, like many people decided, I guess, to settle in the Okanagan to probably just enjoy better climate than Saskatchewan, let's say. And of course, the other candidate in this race is Robert Stupka from the BC Greens, who's a professional engineer and sustainability expert. The one path that I did see for the Liberals to lose was a low turnout situation, one where They just aren't motivated or don't care. And the only thing that's initially looking that way is I did find the advance ballot numbers for the first day of voting. And in the election, that first day of voting was about 2,200 ballots cast. In the 2013 by-election where Christy Clark was first elected there, there were 2,000 ballots cast on that first day. But this year there was only 842. So maybe it's down by half or more. Maybe it was just late January, early February in Kelowna, and people didn't feel like going to the polls. And it's hard to say that the people who are going are BC NDP supporters or BC Greens. It's still a stretch. Yeah, if you're the BC NDP, you know, one of the five BC NDP people living in that riding, are you you really... There (laughs) were 3,000. Are you really going to make a point to go out to advance polling? Maybe, but... There just isn't a lot going on, especially when you're the when you're in government, which is generally even harder to win a by election during. So yeah, it's something, but I I probably wouldn't read too much into it. So will Ben Stewart get over fifty percent of the vote? Uh, I think so. The other thing to watch for in this and by elections are sometimes bellwethers of what's to come, and other times just less connected, but. Do you think the Greens will be able to push into second in this? I know the Greens are really pushing hard in the Okanagan, and I've seen some of them really trying to showcase how well they did, particularly in the last election in some of the Kelowna area and Penticton riding. You know, you get enough of those hippies and small business types. Yeah, I think there's a chance they can edge up to um, second place on this, but it's... Maybe a 40% chance. All right, we'll just have to run this election <laughs> at least five times. It's one of the more common writings to run a by-election in, in recent BC history. So. Well, and if Diane Watts had won, she'd need a seat somewhere. Moving on to quit takes. It's been a raft of announcements from the BC government, which is not coincidentally timed to fall right after the BC Liberals announced their new leader. It's almost like they want to suck all of the air out of the media cycle to talk about everything except Andrew Wilkinson. The other thing I was thinking is it's a good opportunity before the legislature starts sitting and every MLA needs to be there 
every day, all of the time, in case there's a vote. So the MLAs who want to go and do a announcement at JJ Bean in North Van can do that. But next week, once the legislature's sitting, they all need to get back to legislative work. So first thing that came out was the government's added a bit more detail to how it's going to manage the sale of legal cannabis in BC. I think they'd announced before that the age would be 19, but they've also added that adults will only be able to carry up to 30 grams. They're going to not sell cannabis in liquor stores. They're going to have the BC Liquor Control Branch, which is going to be responsible for the wholesale, set up a new standalone network of public stores, and then they're also going to license some private retail stores. The private stuff's fine, but like, why go to all the hassle of setting up and paying for the leases and the extra staff and everything for what's essentially going to be just done at the existing BC liquor store locations. Union jobs and more money. Or at least the union jobs. Yeah, it's it's going to cost a bunch of money. So it, it's just a dumb, less efficient way to handle distribution. But yeah, at least they're letting the private sector step in and do some of that stuff. There's a handful of other regulations. You're not going to be allowed to have cannabis just loosely laying around your car, which seems reasonable. It'll have to be sealed in a bag. And if you're caught driving under the influence of marijuana, you will face a 90-day driving prohibition. I don't think we have good roadside tests yet, but they'll find some way to judge you, I guess. You'll be allowed to grow up to four plants per household. Those can't be visible from any public spaces. And landlords and strata will be able to ban cultivation. So I imagine at the next AGM for every strata in BC, there will be the no growing pot on your balcony motion. Well, that would probably be visible from public spaces. So no growing pot inside your condo. This building actually has a no smoking anywhere inside or on your balcony law. Smoking anything. They were clever enough to put that in in advance. Well, it's fame to You need to specify it anyway. And speaking of smoking, you will not be allowed to smoke or vape on beaches, parks, playgrounds, or anywhere children can pretty much go. Okay, so so um, the big 420 festival thing that happens down at the beach every year here, well, you know, they, they can still try and get the, you know, we're fighting the man sort of thing coming out of it. It's Vancouver. We always need a good reason to protest. But I guess the main spaces you'll be able to smoke are alleyways, sidewalks. The art gallery steps, Robson Square. Although the city will probably bring in their own regulations around that. The government still has more to come. The first stores they want to have open by the end of summer, realizing that getting all this running by July 1st, even the federal government has realized they're not going to get it all in place by July 1st. And they still need to put some policies in around pricing and how to deal with edibles. Because I don't think anyone really knows yet. And uh, the other thing they announced on this is that The rules around where pot stores and whatnot are going to be allowed is left to the cities. So in theory, and I know Richmond has already said they're going to do this, they can just not have any retail locations in their cities. Well, and there's municipal elections coming up next year. So most councillors won't be thinking about bringing in cannabis like regulations. They're going to be thinking about re-election. Or in Vancouver's case, just a lechon because we basically have no one running again thinking about buggering off yeah here it's probably going to be an election issue you know a distant 12th or something after you know housing which is going to dominate it and as far as it goes yeah just put it low in the same spots the liquor stores are allowed it, it's fine that way well in vancouver already has some regulations around medicinal dispensaries which are in a legal gray zone anyway. And that was one of the things that wasn't exactly clarified with this announcement. Whether they'll be allowed to sell recreational as well or not, or can they apply for these licenses? So we're at least starting to get a sense of how much of this spring sitting of the legislature is going to be spent talking about weed. And it's going to be a lot because there's a lot of different laws that have to get changed. There's not just going to be an omnibus cannabis act, it sounds like. Or if there is, it's going to be big. And a lot of people have really strong opinions about this. Like the cannabis activists are already upset about the liquor control board is going to be wholesaling it because they want to sell it out of their van still. 
essentially. Yeah, I wonder if we'll uh, see Watermelon take another run for uh, City Council on a more weed stores everywhere platform. We will definitely be following that when it happens. One of the other announcements this week was some of the changes to how ICBC will stop being a dumpster fire. We'll refer you over to Podkeep Our Land because they spent more time on this than we feel like and covered it fairly well. So do listen to their analysis. Basically some caps on soft tissue damage that are supposed to save a billion dollars that would mostly make up the $1.3 billion deficit. Uh, another announcement that came out, Airbnb is now going to be taxed by the provincial government and possibly the municipalities. The BC government's going to be collecting an 8% sales tax and municipalities can go up to an additional 3% on that. So, yeah, it kind of brings it fairly close to the hotel tax, which I believe is 10%. This is basically the floor of what they can or should do as the province. In terms of regulating Airbnbs, the province has, I believe, things in its toolkit it could do, but at Uh, the very least... Accommodations are, I believe, a provincial responsibility, and anything the city's doing it are just delegated provincial powers. And so the minimum they should at least be doing is business that happens in this province, like goods and services that are exchanged, should pay a bit of the sales tax. That's what a sales tax is about. So, good. This felt like a somewhat hyped announcement that they had the executive of Airbnb there to talk about it. And they really tried to talk about this as tax fairness. And I was like, yeah, and I heard you're you're taxing a business the amount it's supposed to be taxed. And they they announced the announcement uh, with several days lead time, whereas the minimum wage one, which we'll be talking about next, I think it was like a day before they're like, oh, hey, by the way, we're doing this thing in North Van. So partial win on Airbnb, it's now up to the municipalities to decide what rules they want to bring in around short-term rentals. The government also announced they're going to try to make sure this applies to any other services like Airbnb, but for now it's mostly just the Airbnb sales tax. The one downside of, well, one of the downsides I think of the government not doing more is this effectively just creates a patchwork of regulations in which the city of Vancouver that started looking at doing some things could be entirely different than New Westminster, than Burnaby and Richmond, let alone the broader Metro Vancouver. And so if you want to go stay at these places, you might be getting entirely different systems depending where you go. And it's like, just standardize this. Well, that's, you know, just comes part and parcel with having, what, 23 municipalities in the metro area like you're gonna have a patchwork no matter what unless the province does its job the money that's going to be raised from this is going to get earmarked for affordable housing which it's only expected to bring in around 21 million which eh, it's, it's something it'll help but kind of maybe enough to build an additional 50 units a year and that's probably enough said about this almost nothing burger of an announcement the other announcement you just teased was the first report of the Fair Wages Commission, which came out earlier today, actually. And this is the how do we get to $15 an hour by 2021 platform pledge that became the get to $15 an hour, maybe, task that they put to this commission. And the commission said, no, we can get to $15.20 in 2021. And we'll do that by going up $1.30 on June 1st of this year to get to $12.65. Then we'll go to thirteen eighty five next year, and fourteen sixty the following June, and fifteen twenty in twenty twenty one, June first. So a few months behind Ontario and Alberta, who are moving there much quicker. But we'll get our fifteen dollar minimum wage. And they even said if the economy is looking great, we could have fifteen to twenty cents more on that. So maybe a fifteen forty minimum wage. Better than that, though, I think is they did recommend once we hit that creating a permanent commission to continually review the low wage market and recommend further increases ideally tied to and they even mentioned the consumer price index or some other economic indicator like we talked with kevin milligan and that's better than having to refight this in the political arena every few years the report which we'll link in the show notes had a good graph of 
all of the times it had been increased since the late 1980s. And there are notable gaps when I think the either the BC NDP wasn't in power or there wasn't an election coming up. Because if the Socreds or Liberals were in, you saw a couple big spikes, like two years before an election, and then it just kind of went back to no increases for a span of time. And I think there was a big spike the first year the NDP got in, or it might have been the election to try to stave off a NDP victory. But it really emphasized how partisan and political the minimum wage has been over the last 30 years. And hopefully this pathway, which seemed fairly uncontroversial, helps get things forward towards a less partisan minimum wage. So the commission's still working on a bit more. It's got another report coming out in March for the five groups of people who have what's called the alternative minimum wage. So this is servers, farm workers, and others who get a lower than the minimum wage. Minimum wage. I don't know what that'll come out with. I'm hoping it'll abolish them and try to move them up to one standard rate because that's just me and what I would want to see. And maybe we could even move to a society that gets rid of tipping because that's just a stupid practice we can rant about Tipping's later. Terrible. There's a couple good uh, what plant money episodes on this, I think, and we're free to not. Anyway, it, it's been covered by other podcasts, but yeah, it's a terrible system. And then finally, doesn't do feedback. Doesn't do feedback on customer service very well. Promotes unconscious biases or overt biases in many cases, where you are racist and you tip people of color less. Yeah, and like even when I get like shitty service, like I, I still feel bad if I leave like less than fifteen uh, percent tip. So it's just not a great feedback mechanism. And there'll be a third report later at some point in twenty eighteen. That is about, quote, reconciling the discrepancy between the minimum wage and the livable wage. So in other words, the minimum wage will be $15 in 2021, but we know the living wage for the city of Vancouver is something like $18 to $20 right now. Well, and with housing going 20% a year, you know, who knows what that's going to be. So how do you live on a minimum wage? And it well, might... It's housing first, but... <laughs> I'm imagining it'll probably recommend another of a, a number of other toolkits to tackle poverty issues so yeah good recommendations all around i think and there was some interesting stuff in the latter half of the report as well looking at the economics and i didn't dive too deep into it but it it did note a few times that any policy the government undertakes will have positive and negative consequences and there's always risks but it seemed to come down pretty hard on the idea that raising the minimum wage will affect youth employment at all and it also questioned some of the other effects on employment and seemed to suggest this won't have a massive negative consequence on employment. And that'll have to be borne out by time. But maybe we'll bring one of our economist friends back in a couple of years and find out how it did. Well, the other thing that happened in BC that lets us move into federal politics is Justin Trudeau was in Nanaimo last week for one of his town halls. And the thing we've learned about Justin Trudeau is he does great in front of crowds, but he also does terrible in front of crowds when he's a bit unscripted. Yeah, in fact, I, I think pretty much every town hall he does gets a fair bit of press coverage, mostly because he says something stupid during it. So the Nanaimo one, to his credit, wasn't his fault. He was asked about kinder morgan pipeline and i think most of the crowd because it's an Nanaimo, was opposed to it and a number of protesters turned up and started heckling him and really irked him and got under his skin you don't have to respect me you cannot vote for me next time that's no problem but you need to you don't respect anyone in this room then i'm gonna have to ask you to leave this room the other part of that the other part of ah, oh, come on come on really Really? Okay, this is it. Will you please respect the people in this room? Will you please respect the people in this room? Will you please respect the people in this room? No, then please leave. If you're not going to respect the people in this room, you need to leave. That's the rule. Sorry. Show of hands. Who thinks it's time for these people to leave? Okay. Please remove her.
So he was arguing with one, eventually turned in teacher mode and said, you need to respect everyone else. And if you're not going to respect me and everyone else in this room, you need to leave. Go to the principal's office. And then she got dragged out. And then someone else comes up and he goes, oh, come on. <laughs> and he just really gets turns on her and tries to get the whole crowd. He's like, all right, everyone here who doesn't like her here being here, raise your hand. And like a whole bunch of hands going up <laughs> around the room. It's actually worth watching the video, but it was just a bad news cycle for him because you have protesters on the one side and you have Trudeau sounding like a weird teacher trying to get the unruly class back in order. But following that, he went to Edmonton where he did another town hall. And this one... A little clip of it made the rounds of the UK far-right press, apparently, because I guess Pierce Morgan, a commentator over there, thought this was political correctness gone wrong. And what the initial clip showed was this woman talking about female equality in church or something, and she says, Maternal love is the love that's going to change the future of mankind. So we'd like you to look uh, we, we like to say people kind, not necessarily mankind, because uh, yeah. it's more inclusive. There we go, exactly. <laughs> yes, thank you. We can all learn from each other. <laughs> and depending where you're coming from, that's either him going political correctness gone wrong and all that kind of stuff, or it's him mansplaining to a feminist what words you should use. The reality, and the National Post gets credit for this, is this woman, I guess, rambled for four minutes without a clear point. She sort of talked about her church for a bit and then talked about the women's role in that church. And so I could tell Trudeau was probably just trying to find a way to get out of this question. <laughs> and so he saw a way to like squeeze an awkward joke in there. Yeah, the, those situations were someone just kind of talking that a real kind of clear point or much of a direction or anything can be barely excruciating. So uh, I can have a little sympathy for him there. And Trudeau's bad at making jokes off the cuff, it seems. He's the guy famous for whipping out his CF-18s, or not wanting to whip out his CF-18s every time he could. And people kind seems to fall into that, especially because, as the National Post points out, there are better words than people kind, which is not actually a word, like humankind, or even just humanity. Humanity is a word. You can just say, we're in it for all of humanity, and it actually sounds better. They even point out that person kind is a word, but just, yeah, people kind. They finish the article with, nobody says that. Why Trudeau chose to go with that word instead of significantly more natural options might be the real mystery here. That was the dumbest story of the week. No, no, the wine was, was dumber. <laughs> But speaking of controversies around pipelines, uh, Ottawa's decided that whole National Energy Board thing, yeah, we'd probably get rid of it and maybe replace it with something else. The National Energy Board, set up by his father, which burned him in Alberta, so you think he could get credit for this? I don't think he will. There's been a bill introduced, C69, which is tagged as a kind of one project, one assessment model where... The National Energy Board is going to be done away with, and instead there's going to be a new Impact Assessment Agency of Canada, and that's going to be kind of the central place where all the decisions and consultations happen. And, you know, when that says it's a go, that's it. That's going to be a go, or no go. Except Cabinet retains a right to veto any decision or decide something goes ahead when they say no, but that's their prerogative, I guess. This impact assessment agency is going to mash together all of the environmental, health, social, and economic impacts and also look at indigenous issues around any major project that needs to go through this assessment process in Canada. And that centralization has a lot of environmentalists nervous because well, realistically, it's fewer places to clog up the pipes, as it were. Maybe it'll work out and be the streamlined approval process they're hoping for. The other things they're promising to put through is that there'll be tighter timelines. So smaller projects, I don't know how those are defined yet, will have to be approved or rejected within 300 days. And the larger projects that bring a full panel together have to be 
completed in 600 days. Right now, they say the timeline is 24 months, which is 730 days. The one thing they're trying to give for the environmentalists, though, is right now the NEB has a standing test, so you actually have to have an excuse to be there. They're going to get rid of that and just let everybody come forward. Who wants to? Those are going to be fun. Well, to be fair, you look at all of the consultations the BC government has been doing recently, and they haven't asked a standing test for the Human Rights Commission. So well, I, it's feasible. Yeah. I think in that case, the standing is pretty clear in that we're human. We yeah. have rights. Or, But the Fair Wages Commission, I don't have any contribution. I'm not a low-income, I'm not a minimum wage earner, I'm not an employer, I'm not an economist, but I could have submitted all the comments I wanted. That's true. Someone just has to read them then. The other thing this bill is going to create is the Canadian Energy Regulator. So that will be responsible for the regulation side. So you have the Impact Assessment Agency to approve something, and then you'll have the regulator to monitor it after. All of this, plus the ex- beefing up the scientific capacity of all of the agencies needed to look at this, will cost a billion dollars over five years. And the big criticism that Elizabeth May and some of the environmental groups have already pinpointed, though, is the conflict of interest rules seem like there's a loophole where if you're a board member of that energy regulator, the nuclear safety board, or petroleum boards for offshore sites, you could also participate in the impact assessment. So you might have people who would be in favor of something sitting on the impact. It might be a bit of a reach. It's not like it oil feels companies. like a bit of a reach because you know we're talking one regulating agency can also sit on a nut. Like, it really does seem like a reach on this one because it's not like oil CEOs are getting appointed to it. What I found interesting is Catherine McKenna was asked, well, would this have approved the Trans Mountain Pipeline? And she's like, oh, of course it would, which I get that they're in favor of the pipeline. But if you want your review process to have legitimacy, I feel like you can't prejudge it like that, even if you had a different process, but you, which you criticized as illegitimate, approve it. Yeah, you can do that. Just, just say the one that's already been approved is already going to be it's from projects from this point onward. Yeah. Like, it, whatever. It, this one's a done deal. We're moving on and making it better in the future. So this bill is 340 pages, so I'm sure there's lots of other things in there that both industry side and environmentalist sides will pull out as great parts or terrible parts. But it is a very comprehensive overhaul of Canada's environmental regulation system, which the Liberals, to their credit, promised to change. So after just over two years, they're finally getting around to it, never minding that the systems they said were broken had already approved the pipelines they said needed to be reviewed. And finally, Canada's in hot water around overseas arms sales again, as it looks like we've finally put the brakes on selling weapons to Saudi Arabia, only to be caught selling helicopters to the Philippines' Rodrigo Duterte, who famously said he likes throwing people out of helicopters. (laughs) Specifically, he said, if you are corrupt, I will fetch you with a helicopter and I will throw you out on the way to Manila. I have done that before. Why should I not do it again? And here's Canada selling 16 Bell 412 helicopters, which would be built in Quebec, for $233 million to his military. So, yeah, there's now a risk of Canadian-supplied helo defenestrators. Ottawa has promised to review this deal and maybe put the stop to this, but they did talk about how they were going to review, review the sale of light armored vehicles to the Saudis, only to have later been shown by the Globe and Mail to have signed off on it after the point of no return. The government's announcement on January 25th around Saudi Arabia was that they had put a pause on further arms exports and were launching a probe. And this week, uh, Christian Freeland said that the probe has so far found no evidence of Saudis using light armored vehicles against the Shiite minority in their country, which I think conflicts with some of the Globe and Mail's coverage in the past showing quite the opposite. 
But it's very awkward for a government, and Trudeau himself, who, when he was in the Philippines, criticized Duterte to his face for human rights abuses, to now be shown selling military equipment to that country. Yeah. I, I guess in a way it's slightly better than the light armored vehicles and that these are utility helicopters. But yeah, it's still not a great thing either way. Apparently you can still use them as a weapon if you literally throw people out of them. Yes. And you, know, you can mount guns on it. I mean, we mount them on our versions. I'm sure you also appreciate the irony of us being able to sell other countries military equipment easier than we can get our own <laughs> especially evil countries yeah but that's yeah i mean yeah we we approve these sales in what matter of months at most it, it, it only takes like 20 years to buy a helicopter in canada maybe bell has already built these 16 helicopters for the philippines and we could just use them instead of fighter jets because realistically we don't really need fighter jets you kind of need fighter jets no didn't you read scott Gilmore's piece in McLean's, we should just get rid of the military and stop kidding ourselves. There's a little tongue-in-cheek in that we should actually be serious about funding it, but... Well, you know what? Scott Gilmore's tongue-in-cheek is a leftist wet dream, so <laughs> it works out. Just a quick update. After we finished recording, and just this morning, Filipino President Rodrigo Duterte announced that he was cancelling the order of Canadian Bell helicopters following Canada's announcement that we'd be reviewing it. So it looks like the story is moot for now. Canada's going to continue to review what was going to happen with these helicopters, but looks like the deal is dead in the water. Can do that by boycotting BC wine. We stand with our wine industry. It is a quality product, and I know anecdotally. Well, to kick off our best of hashtag BC Poly, I want to pick up a tweet that's not in BC Poly, but it follows the Saudi arms deal story. And this comes from at Mathias, journalist, Mr. Trudeau, what do you have to say about Saudi Arabia using Canadian weapons to kill civilians in Yemen? Trudeau, Yemen, I prefer that we say ya person. Liberals, OMG woke bay. <laughs> but in the BC Poly category, we did have a ton of nominations this week. So thanks to everyone who sent things in and please keep do sending them in in the future we couldn't fit them all in this week so we'll go through what we thought were the best but do send more in in the future so we always have more content rather than less yeah uh first up friend of the podcast david mostrop during the excruciatingly long time between the first and second round results in the leadership convention this weekend asked did someone triple delete the results? Other friend of the pod at It's Ryan Clayton tweeted just after the results. The good news is if Ben Stewart wins, he'll be allowed to keep his seat this time. Hashtag BC Poly, hashtag KLW votes. And that one was nominated by fellow Green James Marshall at James BC Greens. And of course, the wine war got a bunch of mentions. So in response to one of the multitude of selfies that were taken with bc wine particularly this one being andrew weaver's kits fuel replied to it with no quails gate though i see notable because ben stewart the candidate in Kelowna west is the owner of quails gate and you can follow him at kits fuel that's k-i-t-z-f-u-h-e-l and the last one i pulled out was sort of unrelated to everything else there were a ton of good tweets around the wine war and around hashtag March on Fernie. But Robson Fletcher at CBC Fletch was watching one of John Horgan's press conferences. And he said, I had to triple check the tape, but yeah, that's what he said. Must have misspoke. Hashtag AB Ledge, hashtag BC Poly. And there's a video attached where Horgan says, I have to say that I do not believe that the actions of the government of British Columbia are consistent with trade agreements that we've signed. Make sure to nominate more great tweets for next week's show. By using the hashtag Best of BC Poly. And that has been Politoast. Find links to the stories we mentioned in the show notes at politoast.ca. Make sure to subscribe or listen to podcasts and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Politoast Pod. Leave us a review and let us know what you think. Support the show and get early access to our interviews at patreon.com slash And if you have ideas for the show, feel free to send them to us. Thanks for listening.